Hey guys, welcome to this episode of Filming the Wild. Today we're going to talk about the Sony A7S III and how it pairs together with the Sigma 60-600 Sports Edition lens and, and how they work together for wildlife filmmaking. So if this is a video you've been looking for to see how these two work together, this is your video. Anyways, we'll talk about the pros and cons, kind of get a little bit more into how they work together, um, what I like and don't like about them, etc and uh, show some footage as well. That's what today's video is all about. Stick around, um, let's get into the video. This is my, world now. my name is Alan Lacey, and I'm a wildlife filmmaker, cameraman, and producer. Adventure with me now. as I explore the amazing world of nature and show you what it's like filming the wild. All right, so welcome back. So yes, today it's all about the Sony a7S III and the Sigma 60 to 600 sports lens. I'm really not gonna talk a whole lot about how, um, all the specs about the camera or the lens because there's many other good videos already out there on YouTube from other creators who um, have really dove into all of the wonderful nitty gritty of each one of these. But today we're gonna really focus more about how they work together to capture footage for wildlife. So that's kind of what today's uh, episode is all about. I'm gonna talk about the pros and the cons about each, um, what I like and don't like about them, and show you some footage reviews and some examples of, of how they work together. So that is what we're gonna get into. All right, first, some of the pros about the Sony a7S III. Um, obviously, it's a lightweight um, and a mirrorless uh, camera from Sony. Really great, it's awesome in, the, in low light, uh, especially for wildlife. When you're filming in um, early mornings and late evenings, that's usually when the wildlife is out and about anyways. So you want a camera that's capable of really performing well in low light conditions. The Sony a7S III is kind of known as the low light king. So this camera is spectacular. I really love it for that purpose. Uh, and when you pair it together with the Sigma 60 to 600, um, this lens I think is a 4.3, a 4.3, no, 4.5, sorry, all the way up to 6.3. So at the 60 millimeter lens, and you're getting a 4.5 uh, f-stop. So it's not as fast as some other lenses out there, um, but it does bring in a fair amount of light. Um, and then obviously when you're at the 600, you're at 6.3. So um, really, really, really good lens, to be honest, um, for the price point that it is. Uh, I really highly recommend this pairing. I have never shot off the Sony 2, uh, 6, 200 to 600, so I can't really compare to that, per se, but um, using this lens comment, it's, it's really fantastic. Another thing I like about the Sony a7S III for wildlife filmmaking is that it does 120 frames per second, so it does a really great slow-mo. And that comes in two ways. One, where you can have a project file base or your main frame rate of 24 or 30, whatever you're shooting at, and you can actually over crank so that your 120 frames per second actually shows up as slow motion. The other way to do it is actually to film it at 120 frames per second and then in post you can slow it down to whatever project base you're working on. Um, so that's a really wonderful uh, feature for wildlife because when you're filming wildlife, you don't always have an insane amount of time with it. So the ability to slow that down and to work with the, you know, taking three seconds and turning it into like nine is so much better to work with when you're working with wildlife. And another caveat to say about the, the frame rate, when you're shooting at 24 frames a second and you um, actually do film at the 120 frame rate slow S and Q mode on the Sony A7S III, um, it's about five times slow-mo. So you really get to break down all the things in detail and really see what's happening. And it's just, it looks so amazing when you're working with wildlife. All right, another feature about the Sony A7S III here, talking more about the camera right now, is uh, it's autofocus system. So this camera particularly has a really amazing autofocus capability. Um, that works wonderful um, when you're out in the field. Now, I tend to use manual focus more often than not because I like to have absolute control over exactly where I want my focal points to be. Um, but in camera, there are some really awesome functions where you can actually change the autofocus setting to track a subject, such as a small bird on a post or whatever you're filming. And it actually does a really great job of tracking your subject, especially if it like flies out of frame it will actually literally put a box over it and track the bird all the way through. And if you're able to like pan along with it, it'll keep it in frame as well. It's pretty spectacular. Um, and another thing about that too, is if, if your subject say goes behind a few branches or a tree, uh, a building even, um, the camera doesn't start hunting for focus. It kind of keeps that focal plane more or less where it was last, uh, the subject was last seen. So whenever it pops out behind something else, it'll actually pick up that subject again relock on focus and you're good to go. So it's actually quite amazing. 
Um, I don't like to use it very often because I'm actually manually focusing more often than not, but it is a really awesome feature of this camera, especially if you don't have those fine skills yet to actually manually pull focus. Another great feature about the camera itself is that you can shoot in, in, in format S-Log3, um, which is the color profile, and it allows you to have a lot more control in your post-production and bringing out the best of the color from the camera. A lot of the other profiles, um, like Cinetone and all that stuff, it works great for people, and it's a quick, easy, down and dirty, get the image out as quick as you can. However, um, when you shoot in S-Log3, you have a lot more control over the final processed image. All right, and now back to really the, the reason this camera shines is because of low light. This camera is absolutely amazing when you're working in low light conditions. It has um, basically kind of, kind of a dual ISO, which is the sensitivity to light. Um, so when you're shooting on this camera, when you're at uh, 800 ISO, it's kind of like the, or 640, is kind of like in that native ISO range, I think 640 for this camera. Um, it's where it's the cleanest image you're gonna get. But then as you bump up your ISOs, when it starts getting darker, and you go to 12,800, all the ISO cleans up again, and it's really, really clean image to work with at that uh, at that higher ISO range. So it's it's a fantastic uh, camera to use. Um, I've filmed a lot of with it in the late evening hours, early morning hours, and the images come out so clean. So it's a it's it's honestly you're out shooting a good 20, 30 minutes later than all the other people that are out filming um, because you get that extra time because of that sensor in this camera. And it's just, it's, it's remarkable. Same thing with the, uh, earlier on. You can start rolling camera a lot earlier in the morning than other people in other camera systems because of this actual camera. So that's a huge thing. All right, so the other thing about working with this camera um, is you can actually utilize um, an external Sony modification where you get just basically a start and stop record, which I like to use. Um, if I can find it, I'll put it here shortly, but it's a, uh, you just plug it in the side of the camera and then you can actually attach it to the handle of your tripod and it allows you to actually start and stop record without having to find this area on the camera. Now a couple of things I don't like about the camera um, is the spot where the record button is. So when you have this camera completely rigged out, um, one of the cages that comes over, it actually is just right beside so it's kind of hard to get in and find where that record button is. So it's kind of a challenge. Um, I don't really know why they put it there, to be honest, when you have a cage system that's going to go around. But that's why I use the remote stop and start for record. A couple other things I don't like about the camera um, is this rotating articulating screen. Um, it's actually useful. I, I do enjoy it a lot, but it is kind of a little bit flimsy. There's a lot of play in the, I don't know if you can see if I just put the camera down here. There is a fair amount of play and wiggle in the actual screen. So I, I feel like it's, you gotta be very careful. You don't accidentally do something that catches it because it feels like it could break. Um, another thing also too, is when the camera is on and you're working with trying to um, utilize the spot focus on the lens, um, or I'm uh, sorry, on the viewfinder, on the actual articulating screen, it's a pretty small um, button. So it's hard to sometimes accurately touch the subject you want to work with. Um, and then have it actually track. So it takes sometimes a couple of touches before it actually finds the subject you want to, if it's a smaller subject. So those are a couple things I don't particularly like about the camera, but it, you know, they're small minuscule kind of things that, you know, I, I can easily overlook. Another couple of things I don't like about the camera um, is also the uh, HDMI port on the side here. Um, right here on the side, it, when you, when I plug in my HDMI connection to my Atomus Ninja 5 controller, um, it sometimes disconnects. Um, so it's a little bit flimsy, I think. I, I know it's designed for a little bit of play, which is, is necessary because of obviously cables move. Um, but I do feel like sometimes the, the contacts maybe dis, uh, don't always connect. And so if you're like rotating your monitor screen and it jiggles the lens, or not the lens, but the, the cable, HDMI cable, sometimes you lose your signal to your monitor. And that's kind of frustrating. Um, another thing that I've discovered, even though this camera is great and uh, it doesn't overheat very often here in Arizona, it can overheat <laughs> out in the direct sun. It can get really hot. There is a function you can go in and turn that off a little bit, but then I don't know how much damage is actually happening to the camera. So I try not to do that very often, but it does in direct sunlight here in Arizona. Um, it certainly can run into a little bit of overheating issues. Um, so something to be in mind if you're in a hot environment. And last but not least, one of my biggest issues with the camera for wildlife and honestly it's kind of just a pet peeve of a lot of cameras is it doesn't have pre-roll built into the camera which i know that's a whole function thing uh, i've shot a lot on red cameras and they have a really wonderful uh, ecosystem to work with 
which is, it has a pre-roll function. So you can actually um, sit and wait for your subject to do something interesting behaviorally wise. And then you can, after it happens, you can actually still capture the moment because it's continually recording to a cache, which allows you to capture the moment that already just happened up to like three to 10 seconds, depending on it. This camera, however, there is none of that. So you basically either have to know your subject really well to anticipate behavior to be able to hit that record button before it happens with enough lead time, or um, you just have to roll constantly, which chews up a lot of data because the file sizes um, from this camera can be kind of large. So that's something to keep in mind in your data management of how you want to go about filming. If you're trying to film some specific, specific behaviors, that can be a challenge because um, you might have to roll for an hour or two before you get the shot you want. And then you have all this footage that you're not gonna be able to use because uh, it's just a bird sitting on a twig or something. <laughs> um, so that's one thing. However, when you pair this camera with the Atomos Ninja 5 recorder, um, you can get access to pre-roll through the Ninja 5. Um, so on the Ninja 5 systems, there's actually, I think, a 2.3 to 3 second pre-roll depending upon the frame rate you're shooting at and what um, all the different uh, settings you have it at, um, which actually is kind of nice. Um, and you can still trigger that manually um, with like my start and stop. It'll hit the pre-roll function and uh, off it goes and it recaptures up to three seconds before the moment you hit the record button. So that's that's one way around it. All right, so that's the camera. Now, in order to attach the lens to the camera, you actually have to use um, Sigma's MC11 adapter, which goes from the Sony to, well, this is for the Canon because this is a Canon mount EF. Um, so this goes uh, from the Sony E to the Canon EF. So that's the, the only thing you gotta really worry about. The, this is actually a pretty simple thing. Um, there's no glass in the MC11 adapter. It's uh, completely, uh, I'm gonna my finger through it, um, but it's just completely open, just basically an adapter. But it does have all the pin contacts that you need so that the camera and the lens can communicate with each other. Um, so that is awesome. Um, they work really well together, integrated. So let's get this set up real quick. Always adjust, there we go. And the Sigma lens, it's a, bit, it's a bit heavy, but it actually works really well. So the combination, there we go. Voila, there we are. Such a great um, lens to work with. Um, I have no really complaints about it, honestly. We'll take off the lens hood here. There she is. So, um, put that aside. This combination is honestly kind of been my workhorse for the last couple of years. So I've really kind of gotten to know it well. Um, I obviously do manual focus. So I put this focus ring along the manual focus ring section. Um, but it's a fantastic combination, honestly. So the lens itself, um, obviously it's, it's a zoom lens, 60 to 600. So you get at the wide end 60, all the way out to 600. And what I like about the lens is it actually allows you to utilize this section of the lens right here to be able to pull focus, or not focus, but uh, your zoom, whether in or out, you can utilize the actual front of the lens itself, or um, obviously you can still twist if you wanna go the old fashioned way. But I do like that function and feature. So, and sometimes in a pinch, it's really handy to just get it out real quick. Honestly, this lens puts out a really great image. Um, one of the things this lens is known for is at the 60 uh, millimeter end, um, the wide, it does have a little bit of uh, chromatic aberration, uh, which shows up, especially if you're working with some image like a, let's say you're in a forest with a lot of branches, you'll see that chromatic aberration taking place along the edges, which is kind of annoying. And it does happen in video and in, in images, you certainly see it and in video it's there too. Um, but that, that range from 60 to 600, it's, um, I, I, I honestly, I use 60 to a fair amount. I kind of actually tend to go up to about 80 where the chromatic aberration is not as bad. Um, it does reduce a lot, um, but it does allow you to get a lot more wide than say the Sigma 150 to 600. Um, so I do enjoy that aspect because it just really allows uh, to capture more of the scene and placing your subject, especially wildlife in the scene a lot better. The lens also has really good optical stabilization. Um, so when you are out filming, especially working, if you're doing anything handheld, um, the optical stabilization works great. However, obviously if you're putting yourself on a tripod, 
Um, I turn off the stabilization because then you have a, a fluid head tripod that's stabilizing and you put a stabilizer in it, it creates a really weird effect. So I don't use it very often. Every once in a while I will if it's like say really windy or something, it still creates some issues, but um, having it off really makes it so much easier to work with and to be able to stabilize anything in post if you need to. Honestly, working with this lens, the autofocus from the Sony a7S III communicates with this lens very well. Um, it does uh, communicate to the point where it's very quick um, and it stays locked on subject um, pretty well. So I've actually been pretty impressed with that. I've never really tested it with the Sony 2 to 600 lens. So I don't know how it compares um, to that lens, but I will say that the autofocus does work extremely well with a Sigma 60 to 600 if you're gonna use that feature of the camera. Um, and I have no issues with it whatsoever. It does a very good job of staying locked on subject. Now the lens itself obviously goes to, out to 600, but I find that um, when you're about at 400 millimeters, that is when your image is actually the most sharp with this lens. It still is pretty sharp at 600, um, but at 400, it seems like that is where I'm getting the best, sharpest, cleanest images utilizing the Sigma lens here. Um, that being said, 600 is still absolutely amazing. There are no issues shooting at 600. I do that actually quite a lot um, and it, work, it still looks absolutely amazing. Still very sharp. Um, it's just right at 400, you re it just really seems to shine. Um, but I still use it at 600 quite often. Now the other thing you can do is um, Sigma does make a couple of extenders, a 1.4 1. 1. and 2.0. Um, so basically you can extend out the two times, 1.4 times. Um, I kind of stay away from the two because it, the image does start to get a little bit soft. Um, at the 1.4 extender that you can get, the image actually still holds up pretty well. It does get a little bit more soft, um, but it's definitely still usable. I just don't use it very often. Um, in certain situations, I might put it on um, if I just need that extra bit of reach. But for the most part, I just kind of stay as is camera and lens um, because that's obviously where you're going to get the most sharp images or footage. Um, so that's that's ideally where I, I keep this lens in its happy place. <laughs> um, but you can use them. And, and the autofocus works a little bit with the 1.4 extender. It doesn't allow all the features, I don't believe. And I don't think the auto the autofocus focus does not work with the uh, two by extender. Um, it's just, you have to do everything manually at that point, which is fine by me, but um, if that's a deal breaker for you, it's something to consider. Another thing I like about the Sigma 60 to 600 is its minimum focus distance, which I believe is two feet, if I am correct, um, which, you know, means you can really get some pretty awesome shots um, pretty close up. It's not like you're just, it doesn't replace anything macro by any means. And it really works well because you can zoom in and still have that minimal focus distance uh, that you can still play with. So your subject can get pretty close if you need to, and it can really uh, bring out some really awesome shots. Some of the cons about the lens itself, obviously, um, the bigger the lens you get, the more it weighs. So I don't know if that's really a con, but it does weigh a fair amount. I don't know what the whole combination together is, but you know, several pounds, four to six pounds, probably, or maybe seven pounds, um, all said and done. Um, so holding it handheld, if you're gonna do photography with it, um, Easy to do, not, a, not an issue, but if you're trying to hold something steady, for film, and uh, try to catch a footage, obviously you're gonna need a tripod because that's uh, that's a lot of work to do to hold up something still and, and keep things pretty simple and straight and sturdy. So one of the cons about this is, is probably, I mean, it's just the way it is with a bigger lens, is just the weight. So if you're gonna do any filming um, handheld, it's gonna be a lot more challenging because of the weight. It does allow you to brace a little bit more and to make a little bit smoother pans because of the weight. Um, but uh, I would definitely recommend putting this on a tripod. Um, and it does come, obviously, with the shoe mount here that you can actually put, it looks like it's got an already built in Arc, Swiss Arca connection um, that you can just put into any tripod, which is awesome. It's built into the shoe here. However, uh, the weight doesn't always work out well, so it's nice to be able to get both lens camera support um, with a proper base plate, proper rig, so that everything is properly supported equally, um, which I find is a good thing to do anyways, because then you can balance it more accurately on a fluid head tripod. And I already kind of touched a little bit. Another con is obviously at the 60 millimeter end, um, the more wide, the wide angle of this lens is you do get that chromatic aberration which um, is a thing just to, to keep in the back of your mind. So when you know when you get to that that very wide element on this lens, you're going to have a lot of that chromatic aberration taking place in your footage. So understanding what your background that you're shooting, if you're shooting an open grassland prairie, you're probably not going to get any worry about that. 
But if you're in a jungle or any kind of forest where there's a lot of movement, a lot of stuff happening in the image, that's something to consider. Another thing, con I would say about this lens is currently you have to adapt it between the Sony E-mount and the Canon EF. Uh, so um, there's always little nuances that take place. For the most part, it does a pretty good job. Um, there's currently, I don't believe Sigma has made the 60 to 600 yet with a native Sony mount. Um, I do believe they do have that with the 150 to 600, however, now. So I believe that one does natively, they have an option now well, for a lens that does natively connect to the Sony e-mount system. So that might be something worth considering if you're, if the 60 to 150 millimeter lens part of this isn't a factor for you. All right, so the lens combo together, working with both camera and lens, honestly, for wildlife filmmaking, it is a, a, an awesome, awesome pairing. I highly recommend working with this system. Um, it has served me well. I get fantastic images. The Sony, a, the Sony A7S III, the S-Log3 footage, it looks fantastic. It looks great. Um, it's pretty easy to work with, knowing how to work with that kind of uh, that footage, um, especially when I pair it with the uh, um, Atomos Ninja 5 recorder. It's uh, You can get 10-bit recording out of this camera, but then when you put it into the Sony, or the sorry, the Atomos Ninja 5, this actually puts out a 16-bit raw signal to the Atomos recorder, and then the Atomos uh, will finalize everything at 12-bit. So you get a lot more color depth and information from the sensor directly to their external recorder. Um, so there's an awesome amount of things that you can do um, filming wildlife with this combination. A um, couple things I really like about it is it's compact. It's pretty small um, comparatively to other systems. Um, so you're able to put this into a backpack, into whatever system you're going to work to go out in the field with. You can carry it on your back pretty easily. Um, it fits into both of my camera bags really well. Um, but I use the f-stop um, systems for camera, uh, you know, backpacks. Really good. I recommend that, by the way. Um, but I can get a lot, a lot of equipment into that uh, backpack. And it's, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's light, but you can definitely get a lot of... Um, this this combination with all of the bells and whistles accessories the cages the the base plates audio external recorders etc it all can fit into the backpack and you can take it off into the wilderness go on any expedition you want all your gear can go with you you don't have to worry about carrying a ton of pelican cases around i mean you can do that too but if you're going to go somewhere it's nice to have that ability being such a small compact system like this the other thing I like about this lens is it's kind of almost like a, everything in all, everything in one. 60 mil to 600 allows you to cover a very wide range across the all that focal distance. So like you can really get um, some amazing footage at 600 and then pop back out to the wide and, and really put your subject into the uh, environment that you're filming in. And you don't have to constantly swap out lenses and change things and worry about dust getting into the sensor, etc. It's just really handy to have everything Kind of built into an all-in-one right here which i absolutely love it's really quite nice to to work with actually now we know the sony a7s3 is a great low light camera this lens is not the fastest lens in the world but it is 4.5 all the way out to 6.3 um so even when you're at the telephoto end of the lens um using the camera's low light capabilities it still allows you to stay out in the field a, a lot longer than a lot of people filming because of the ability that this camera can clean up the image um, at 12,800 ISO, which is fantastic. Um, so even as the night gets dark, this lens combination still can work really well in low light conditions. Another thing that you do when you have everything built out and everything's like that, you have the cage and all the camera system built the way you want it, um, it does weigh down a fair amount. So when you put it on a tripod, it kind of helps if, if there's any light wind, it helps uh, cut down any of the wind shake that you might get. However, that being said, when you do have everything up, it kind of sometimes acts as like sails, and so you do get some wind shake. One of the cons about the system is it's it's not as heavy as it needs to be to kind of um, really work on the telephoto lens in, in any kind of windy environment. So you really have to work with a heavy duty tripod if you want to have any kind of success without having too much wind shake in your image. Um, but overall, it's not terribly bad. Um, you can stabilize some of that in post, I've discovered. Um, but it does have a fair amount of wind shake if it's a windy day um, and you don't have a nice beefy tripod. Um, I pair mine on the Sackler Flow uh, Flowtech system, uh, the 75, I think, millimeter head. 
and it works well. It does a very good job, but in high winds, it definitely has a lot of wind shake um, because the tripod isn't the heavy base tripod and the whole weight of the camera as well is kind of light for that kind of wind. The other cons about this would be, obviously if you can work with any tele converters like the 1.4 or two, the images aren't as sharp. Um, those are definite takeaways that I was kind of disappointed in because I thought, oh, I get some extra reach, but no, the, the image does get soft, especially at the at the two by converter. Um, it's, uh, I, it, depending on what you're filming, it could potentially even be unusable in my opinion. Um, now I've never gone in and actually uh, used any of the Sigma software to like actually uh, calibrate everything appropriately with the lens so maybe that could change some of it too but if I try I might try that and tell, get back to you guys later on another video if that actually helps um, but as is it's definitely soft and I wouldn't use it in a lot of uh, situations and another uh, element about this system that if you're just using the camera and the lens only um, and you're gonna go by the proper film rules of doubling your frame rate to know what shutter speed you should be filming at um, in really bright light um, you would, you would have to stop down quite a lot and go way past that rule in order to get good images. So uh, to really get really good footage um, in a brighter light condition, especially since this is such a good low light camera, it does really well in bright light. You have to really stop the camera down. Um, it's to get ND filters. And getting ND filters on this lens, uh, you can obviously get a circular, because I think there's like 130, Five millimeter. It's a very strange or 104 millimeter. I can't remember the exact diameter on the lens itself. It's a very strange um, size, so it's hard to find the right ones, and it can be kind of expensive too. Um, they do make an option, Polar Pro. They have uh, a lot of ND uh, filter options, and they have this thing called Base Camp, which I bought. It does not fit the actual end of the lens. It's actually about a millimeter or two millimeters too small. So I had to actually. Um, get a little ingenious and disassemble that system a little bit in order to make this work um, and got it to actually fit. So it is possible if you have that system and you want to work with it, uh, message me in the comments below. I can tell you how I actually made that Polar Pro Basecamp uh, matte box system actually fit on the lens so I can actually drop in variable NDs. That actually helps tremendously cut down the light when you're working in a bright environment, especially here in the desert in the Southwest. Um, it's kind of an essential thing. So. Um, to get the best images, I would recommend the camera, the uh, lens, and then getting some sort of ND filter system. I use uh, the Polar Pro uh, matte box from the base camp, I think is what they called it. So I love that combination. Honestly, it works really well. All right, so overall, um, this lens and camera combination is absolutely fantastic. Um, it has been, like I said, over the last couple of years, my workhorse for getting out and filming wildlife. Um, it has a fantastic image, especially between the 400 and 600 millimeters, really sharp at 400. It's a very sharp lens. Um, you're going to be able to just really get some awesome, awesome footage with it. Um, it always comes down to you as a cameraman of what you're able to get yourself into in terms of understanding animal behavior, knowing, knowing your subject well to be able to anticipate what's going to happen to be able to film. But having this combination really means that you're going to have some awesome opportunities to get footage that um, can just rank right up there with stuff that you might see on the BBC, etc. They have some pretty expensive systems and cameras that they work with, but for the price point with this lens, um, I believe this is about $1,800 to get this lens here in the US. Um, the camera itself is about $3,500 US. Um, this adapter is a couple hundred dollars as well, I think $150, $200. So those are things to keep in mind when you purchase it. Um, and you can always look for deals, of course, but for the price point of this entire combination, you cannot argue with it. Um, otherwise, you're gonna be spending you know, tens of thousands of dollars to go out and get a normal film camera, proper lenses, etc. So for the price point, this is honestly one of the best options, in my opinion, for wildlife filmmaking. And again, to kind of wrap it up, it's such a, an awesome system where you can pretty much take anywhere with you, especially if you're packing it in a backpack, you can pretty much go anywhere with this combination and get absolutely amazing deep into the wilderness. Um, a couple times I've done that and it's just awesome to be able to come out of your tent, set up and have access to high quality um, 4K, 120 frames a second, 600 millimeter reach. Um, it's just, there's not much out there on the market currently that allow you to do that which is fantastic.
All right, that kind of sums up today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you have questions or anything that you would like me to address about this system, go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section below. Um, always love to hear your thoughts and uh, feedback, um, but I know I maybe not have addressed everything, all the questions you have about this uh, particular setup. But if you do, like I say, go ahead and leave a comment. I will do my best to get to those here during the holiday season. Um, but yeah, get out there, go out and shoot, enjoy, practice getting your skills up. If you're able to get this lens combination with the camera, I highly recommend it. It has really served me well over the last couple of years. Um, it's, you know, it, it is fairly expensive, but compared to other systems, actually it's pretty cheap. So um, it's a very budget friendly option. So get out there, enjoy the wild, go out and make your own films, videos. Please share those with me. I would enjoy and I'd love to see the kind of footage you guys are able to get with yourselves out there in the wild filming wildlife. Um, it's really cool. It's such a such a huge passion of mine. I hope this video helps you on your journey as a wildlife filmmaker as well. Um, and again, um, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up. Um, subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so. Um, I'm gonna have more tutorials, behind the scenes content. Uh, maybe it's more gear review like this. Um, so uh, yeah, if you want to stay up to date on that, make sure you turn that bell on once you subscribe. That way you're notified of any of my upcoming videos. But in the meantime, keep an eye out for the next episode of Filming the Wild.